uh, first of all, I would be uh, inviting uh, Dr. Bidan Pramanik for uh, for his talk. And uh, before that, um, um, I will be uh, actually uh, reading out his uh, brief profile. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me. Um, the topic is uh, mosquito-inspired microneedles and patches. Dr. Bidan uh, Pramanik is from IIT Goa. Uh, Dr. Bidan Pramanik has a PhD in MEMS and uh, microsystems, my, that is microelectromechanical systems, and he's currently an assistant professor at IIT Goa. He is also a, he was also a postdoctoral fellow between 2017 and 18 in IIT Kharagpur and a postdoctoral research investigator, 2015 to 2017 at the University of California at Irvine and in uh, Technology Co. de Monterrey in Mexico. His areas of interest include MEMS and microsystems, carbon MEMS, microfabrication, nanoenergy, drug delivery, lab on a CD. He has numerous publications uh, to his credit and has received many awards and recognitions for his work. And this includes the MHRD scholarship assistantship in 2004 and the CSIR SRF uh, Senior Research Fellowship in 2010, to name a few of the honors that he has received. He has also been awarded with the uh, COA, CYT candidate level by the Science and Technology Department, Mexico in 2016. We're very happy to have uh, Dr. Vidan Pramanik in our midst, and he is going to deliver a talk on mosquito-inspired microneedles and patches. Over to Dr. Vidan. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Suresh, uh, for my brief introduction. And uh, good evening to all of the participants. And uh, what the name I can see, Dr. Karthik, uh, and uh, other people who are here. Uh, let me, yeah, Dr. Jayant is also here. So let me share my screen and to start my presentation. Uh, Dr. Jayant, can you hear me? Dr. Jayant? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, thank you. Yeah, so <clears throat> again, once again, thank uh, um, Dr. Devashish and uh, Professor Pragasam for inviting me for this initiative. Uh, and uh, this kind of initiative, we should uh, practice regularly so that what we can see at this moment that it will be the uh, future uh, mode of teaching and uh, mode of uh, uh, this kind of conferences and all. So I'll be talking about mosquito-inspired microneedles and patches. Uh, so my introduction already, Professor Shuresh has uh, already told. So I'm a Western professor there at IIT Goa. I joined two, two years back and I'm just going to leave there. So in my talk, I will mostly uh, discuss about what is the need of microneedle and what kind of microneedle I'm working on, I'm developing, and uh, what kind of applications I'm just trying to cover it up. Now, before starting my uh, actual presentation, actual work, uh, so you can see this is the conventional needle uh, and microneedles are here. First, look at the dimensions of that one. This is the conventional needle, which uh, generally used for medical purposes. So outer diameter of that needle is, uh, around 800 uh, micrometer and inner diameter is 570 micrometer. So based on the uh, volume of drug, which is required to be inserted in a patient's body, based on that, these kind of needles are selected. So size of that needle, you can see, uh, and, and looking at that, you can feel how painful it is to take uh, an injection. So there will be many people who really fear uh, to have injection, including me. I also. Uh, afraid of taking injections. So this is not because only the pain, this is kind of a trauma, just looking at the needle, uh, some people really fear for that. Now, why we feel pain? We'll, I'll discuss in a uh, short while. But uh, if you go to a doctor, you'll see that the first, uh, the taste will be a blood test to see uh, what is happening with the patient. 
So either this needle will be used to insert drug or it will be used to withdraw blood uh, or any interstitial fluid from body for diagnostics purpose. So it, it will be a regularly used uh, thing. It is nothing that you can avoid or there will not be any such devices which will be used for contactless thing. Uh, so definitely we have to have it. It is, it is an unavoidable thing to uh, uh, discard use of needle. So first and foremost application, if you look at this moment, that is uh, a healthcare application uh, and the device which we generally use, mostly use that is a glucometer to test uh, the blood glucose level. And in that case also, there will be plenty of devices which uh, is used based on the principle of contactless or um, non-invasive way of measurement. But mostly uh, you'll find that finger pricking glucometer is used. Uh, it is also a very simple thing. A small needle is used to prick uh, a finger and taking a drop of blood and finally it will be put there in the glucometer to uh, basically measure the blood glucose level. But you can see this blood will come out. You, you cannot avoid that one. So somewhere you have to prick, somewhere you have to use needle uh, to uh, pinch, uh, to actually puncture uh, the tissue and, and your uh, blood capillary to take that blood out. So this is also a painful. It is not that severe uh, painful, but pain is still there. Now, why we feel pain? Uh, so basically the microneedle I'm talking about, that will be a pain-free drug delivery or uh, take out of interstitial fluid. Uh, this integration of smart system will be there with the microneedle. Uh, mixing of drugs, uh, patient specific can be possible. Uh, it can penetrate even tough tumor. These are the applications, these are the uh, basically the properties which we are looking to use this microneedle. And the delivery will be highly localized for, uh, for the use of microneedle. Mm -hmm. uh, since it is very localized, so the chances of infection will be very, very less. And it will be a very controlled drug delivery. The, the, the precise amount of drug can be delivered through this microneedle. Now just look at this image. Uh, basically it is our skin. Uh, and then we are, uh, from the top surface, we are uh, penetrating through the uh, uh, inside of the microcapillary. So this is the conventional syringe generally used to deliver drug or withdraw blood from this capillary. So we feel pain only when this needle touches the nerves. So until it is touches, uh, it, it, it touches the nerve, we cannot feel any pain. So it means that we can avoid touching that nerves so that we can avoid the sense of this pain. If you see this guy, and uh, sorry, this basically it is a lady mosquito who, who take that one. So when it bites, basically that, that is painless. You cannot feel, if it is not greedy that much, it will uh, suck blood and it will fly away. You will not feel anything. But since it is started uh, secreting the anticoagulant uh, to resist uh, the, the uh, coagulation of blood, basically at that time only we feel something uh, itching at the surface. So it is not because of the needle or because of the, uh, uh, the physical, if we see here, that is the magnified image of that one. Uh, this part is called labium and this part is the fascicle. So this is actually a micro needle, you can say. And this part is inserted through our uh, skin to the capillary to take blood out by this mosquito. So thing is that if it is not secreting any anticoagulant, any, any chemicals, will not feel that it is biting us, it is taking blood from our body. So taking that concept, basically we are again biomimicking. We are taking the idea from mosquito bite and we're trying to replicate this small microneedle so that we can avoid pain. That is the idea of developing this microneedle. By the way, the dimension of this one, you can see it is uh, uh, the diameter, is, it is in the range of 30 to 35 uh, micron and the length of this one, it is around 500 micron is the length of this physical part, basically, uh, which is inserted in our body. 
now you can see the categorism micron little so we have to replicate or we have to mimic uh, the mosquitoes say uh, physical but we have some limitation we cannot simply make it we have some technological limitation we have some material limitation we have some uh, structural limitation also that we cannot make any kind of uh, structure we cannot make any kind of shape so this is a typical table you can find where uh, it is categorized with a uh, different structure a uh, different shapes even the tip shape when it is inserting what will be the tip uh, shape and the materials used so you can see there are several materials used used till date uh, and for different applications they have uh, the researchers have used like drug delivery gene delivery and blood extraction so many applications are there if you look at the the actual principle what you have to follow this is the governing equation of the flow rate if you are using it for drug delivery so basically this pressure uh, the actuation pressure which is actually should be given to the drug or fluid which will be inserted into the body where this p skin which is the pressure required uh, uh, which is the uh, drag basically and the skin friction due to the fluid flow so when fluid is flowing from the needle to the body this will be the uh, friction basically it will be resisting so your p actuation should be more than p skin and uh, the simplest flow rate calculation would be done by this equation so this is q is the flow rate and with the simplest equation you can find out uh, what should be your p actuation to uh, to get that desired flow rate and l is the length of the needle although it is a very simplest equation but it will not be that simple when you will be developing it so we have to take as so many parameters at that time now this is the fluid uh, pressure what you have to uh, apply when you are uh, you are inserting drug in the body but before that you have to puncture your skin otherwise uh, your needle cannot uh, insert it it cannot be inserted in your skin so how much force is required uh, to puncture is uh, to puncture the skin that is also most important and you can see and based on that you can choose your material which material will be suitable to make the micro needle so you can see our skin generally typically it it uh, requires uh, 3.18 megapascal is the force which is not that much even you can uh, some polymers like acetate and all you can use it for developing this micro needle but what happens uh once it is punctured immediately that pressure drops to 1.6 uh, megapascal so there is a high chance if you are not carefully doing it just penetrating our skin it can hit the other tissue and it can damage so at that time pain will be huge so you are trying to make it a painless but there is a chance of uh, high pain if you are not careful so these are the parameters generally we need it for before developing any kind of micro needle these are the some developed micro needles by different very uh, research groups so these are the solid uh, silicon micro needle these are some uh, square kind of micro needle uh, these are hollow micro needles with some channels uh, so these are already uh, developed in past two decades some other uh, shapes of micro needle so you can see the size of this micro needle is not uh, that big so it is uh, in the range of 100 uh, micron is the height of that one so that is not enough to deliver any kind of drug in our body because 100 micron is nothing but the width of your hair single hair so we have to think little big one research group from iit kharagpur and one from uh, uh, south korea they, uh, they this was a very famous work they have developed a complete uh, blood basically uh, blood withdrawing system where you can see this is a, a device which will push this needle micro needle which is attached with this device so this device is actually a blood extraction device and uh, this micro needle is uh, connected with that device but this micro needle has to be inserted into the human skin so basically this is a shape memory alloy Uh, when a current will be passing through this shape memory alloy so this spring will expand you can see in this image this spring will expand and this whole thing will be inserted this micro needle will be inserted in the body 
then the work of this uh, blood extraction device will be in, in action and blood will be taken from the, uh, the blood vessel. So again, it is not fully pain free uh, because it will be going to take blood from the blood vessel and definitely it will touch the nerve. So there is uh, again, there is no chance of avoiding fully uh, the nerve because nerves are arranged so randomly there. But this is a very famous work at that time, last uh, five or six years back. What I, I was looking that uh, to sacrifice some of the applications, if we cannot address uh, all the application by developing only a single device. Now, what I would, I would like to sacrifice that I'll not go to the, uh, the, the blood capillary or blood vessels. I deliver drug only in this transdermal uh, region. So only from the skin surface, it will go to the around 300 to 350 micron, I can go down and I can deliver my uh, drug here. And you can see there are several number of micro needles. And so it is making a kind of patch where drug reservoir will be here. So if I enlarge one single micro needle, it will be look like that. This is the micro needle length where it will be a kind of flow channel and uh, drug will be coming through this uh, hollow thing to the uh, epidermis region basically. So in that way we can think of and we can reduce our application area and we can make a, a pain-free drug delivery system. What I did uh, in 2016, uh, at the time my interest, I, basically before that I was working on silicon microelectromechanical system, uh, the material what I was using. But uh, in the year of 2015 or 16, I was a little bit inclined to work with the carbon microelectromechanical system, which is called basically uh, carbon MEMS. So I was using a photoresist called SC weight, which is a negative photoresist and it is very useful photoresist. So uh, I was trying to make different kind of structure. And I found uh, the, initially it was a SC weight solid uh, needle and uh, then I, I actually pyrolyzed it uh, in an inert environment. Uh, I uh, heated it up. So all the non-carbon atoms came out from this structure. And uh, you can see this is the initial uh, diameter. But after pyrolysis, it is, it is just shrunk. So because all the non-carbon atoms, uh, it came out. So only which is left, that is carbon-carbon bond. So this is a carbon structure. Same thing happened with the hollow thing. When I just kept a, a area like this, uh, same thing happened. It, it is shrunk, but the shrinkage, percentage of shrinkage, which is actually uh, the outer one, it is actually increased. You can see the percentage of shrinkage means the outer diameter is shrunk, it is 34.92%, but uh, here it is 42.44%. I found it is a completely opposite thing, opposite story when this inner diameter is more uh, to a ratio of the outer diameter. And I found that the outer diameter, basically it is uh, shrunk only 15.49%. So I faced a problem. If I wanted to develop a micro needle using this carbon, or using this SC weight photoresist, I should have a data set. Otherwise I cannot make a particular carbon micro needle. So I made a complete study of this one, what will be the size of the microneedle, the shrinkage of that one, the complete data set I made it. Now, what is this carbon MEMS I talked about? And why I was so much interested, inclined uh, from silicon to carbon? Now, you know, if all of you know that carbon is the, uh, like the material which is having almost all the other drops, uh, which is available in the nature. It has insulator, it has uh, highly conductive, uh, allotrope, it has highest um, uh, hard material. So all the things are there. Also, there is a uh, allotrope called glassy carbon, which is actually, I was looking for to, to, to work on it. It is a very, uh, there is a debate that whether it is allotrope or not, and whether it is a, a, a completely 2D material or completely 3D material, that debate is still going on. But this material, what we say that it is not amorphous one, it is not insulator, it is actually conductive material, uh, which has some glass-like uh, properties, which is conductive, which is 
highly chemical resistive. So that's why I wanted to work with this classic carbon material. Now this gaseous carbon material, we can get it from this AC weight pyrolysis. So the image, what I have shown you, this is actually a glassy carbon material, but earlier it was a AC weight structure. Once pyrolysis has done, then I found it, it becomes a glassy carbon, which is actually conductive. But working with this carbon, it is very, very difficult, a daunting task because carbon is, I said, it is a hard material, but at the same time, it is very, very brittle material. Shaping carbon, it is really, really hard. Then I uh, remembered my friend's uh, photographs, what uh, Dr. Samira Hosseini, she was a uh, postdoc colleague. So she actually drawn this image. You can see that if you'd really like to get a diamond, uh, it will be a hard delivery. So these are the coals. So you can, you can relate with that one. So if you'd like to work with carbon, really you'll feel, you'll feel pain. And of course, to make a pain less drug delivery, definitely you will feel pain. So what is carbon MEM? So carbon MEM is basically playing with the uh, precursor which you can machine it, which you can pattern it. I'm not going in details with that one, uh, but basically what I mean to say, uh, the people who are, uh, who know about microfabrication and all, they know that photolithography is the heart of any microfabrication process. This is typically photolithography uh, representation where uh, this color, uh, this color basically it is a photoresist, uh, which is patterned. And finally, this green film is also patterned. So to, to pattern green film, you need to use photoresist and light will be passing to react with photoresist. And finally, you can pattern your film. Taking that idea, that photolithography, uh, what we are doing with these carbon MEMS, after this, we are using that photolithography uh, concept up to this. And finally, we are putting these 3D structures or 2D structure, whatever you are uh, developing. You just take it and put it in the furnace in an inert environment to make it a glassy carbon structures like that. It will become black, definitely. Carbon is a black color. Uh, so I'm not going to in details of this pyrolysis process. It is a very old process, ancient process. Uh, you can see in the ancient uh, old furnace also, people used to make uh, a kind of charcoal kind of thing. So basically, if oxygen is not reaching in the burning process, uh, then due to the heat, non-carbon atoms will come out from the structure. That concept is called pyrolysis. So breaking will be there by heat in an inert environment. So this is the today's sophisticated fondness we use to make that carbon structure. Now what I did, so taking those uh, parameters, those data, what I have developed, how much will be the shrinkage and all, then I uh, uh, basically derive the, the fabrication process which will be used to develop a particular application uh, specified this carbon microneedle. So this is the fabrication process. Uh, which is used to develop micronatal. Dr. Bidan, a, a couple of minutes. Yeah, I'll finish as soon as possible, yeah. So basically these are the photographs you can see for my fabricated carbon micronatals. Some testing is done, how it is hard and how, uh, how much you can, it can withstand. Uh, some testing is done, how uh, due to the bending, what will happen with the micronatals, you can see. And this is the actual image you can see. As I said, this microneedle should be aligned with the reservoir or with the micro channel through which blood, uh, through which uh, either blood will flow or drug will flow. So uh, that thing also you have to uh, take care because here you can see this is this was the initial SU8 microneedle, but after uh, pyrolysis the shrinkage happened and you can see it is misalignment happened. After the final uh, taking care of those things. Uh, this is the cross-sectional view of that one where this is carbon microneedle and this is the inlet to the carbon microneedle. So we tested it with the uh, in the mice body, you can see, but because mice is the novel uh, animal who sacrificed their life for researchers like us. So we tested that one, uh, how much it is penetrating and whether fully it is penetrating and how much, uh, the, how, how many numbers of microneedles are breaking. We did all the things and I found that none of the microneedles uh, actually has been broken due to this insertion. 
uh, so it is very much suitable for drug delivery application so we again uh, calculated we measured how much is the flow rate we are getting from the single microneedle and based on that you can make you can make a patch that uh, uh, how many microneedles are required for a particular application this work you will find in uh, nature micro and nano journal in published in 2019 just quickly i would like to add here that i was also uh, uh, i was crazy to find out the source of carbon which i can use for uh, very much uh, for sensor application i found human hair is the uh, very good resources of carbon and i pyrolyzed that one and found this kind of hollow structure and you will be surprised the dimension i said to you of mosquito labium and mosquito fascicle the, the 30 to 35 micrometer is the outer dia uh, and uh, around 28 to 29 micrometer is the inner dia and you will be surprised to know that if we pyrolyze our hair we can get that same structure which actually mosquito is having so from this we can say that we need to find out we need to search properly which is already there in the nature for our own purpose for our say drug delivery or say uh, with drawing of blood from there i would like to just uh, because time is over i guess so i'd like to stop it here but my i will just tell you would like to tell you uh, my future work with this needle is basically making a neural probes uh, for parkinson as as well as uh, alzheimer's diseases so this kind of patches can be used because carbon microneedle i said it is uh, conductive one so it can it, it is capable of uh, carrying signals too so that is my goal and uh, one of my phd students uh, already has started working on that one so thank you very much uh, for inviting me in this uh, uh, initiative and uh, i'll be i'll be definitely very happy uh, to take your query or your questions uh, and you can also send your questions offline to me yeah uh, so thank you thank you all yeah thank you dr bidan pramanik for taking time from your busy schedule and delivering a wonderful talk it's um, my pleasure yeah i have a few questions a couple of questions Please. uh one is um uh is the drug delivery uh through the patch method based on using micro needle yeah that was the title i think that was the title of your talk and the question is from nikhil sharan so i think the answer is yes or to patch method yeah basically uh, the patches will be made with the uh, the arrays of micro needle and uh, so uh, the patches what we made taking a bandage and uh, uh, in that area where basically we are uh, basically the drug is uh, kept there in the bandage just taking that one out and uh, we placed our micro needles with uh, uh, liquid reservoir there the, uh, the drug reservoir there and we have used uh, for uh, the patch like we have used to deliver drugs using that patch the other question is uh, can we extend this is from dr kayur joshi mm -hmm. can can we extend such micro needle to mm -hmm. micro surgery yeah actually it is a very good question and yeah my target uh, is is towards that kind of application uh, so it is so tiny and these needles are very hard it will be very useful for micro surgery too uh, because uh, uh, the uh, the bigger knives and all the things uh, it cannot be used for micro surgery thing you need some kind of uh, micro structures which will be used for micro surgery and i'm sure it will be very good uh, uh, tool for micro surgery uh, one question from sheikh mohammed s Good evening, sir. Will this cause an allergic reaction? As in a syringe, some people get an allergic infection. Can it reduce the allergy problem? Yeah, yeah. So uh, thing is that we have already tested that it does not show any kind of allergic uh, problem. The material, basically, this material does not show any kind of uh, allergic reaction uh, in, uh, in the patient's body. Not human thing we have uh, tested yet. but in mice body we have already tested uh, it does not uh, show any toxicity uh, but i would uh, say that for testing uh, allergy we can use this device okay okay and a uh, um, couple of question from milan uh, uh, elton disuza 
how about the fluid mechanics through the micro needle? Does the behavior change as scaling applies? Can fluid flow be controlled? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Yes, it can be controlled. And uh, for that, definitely you should not use a conventional micro pump to, to give that pressure. What I said, like actuation pressure, you have to use a micro pump for that where uh, the flow rate will not be that high. So uh, it will be in the range of 10 microliter per second, not more than that. For that kind of application, definitely you can control fluid flow, the flow rate, and uh, yeah, you can use it for that kind of application. And fluid uh, fluid behavior, fluid flow behavior, will uh, uh, you can control it. It will be turbulent if you'd like to use uh, for mixing of drug purposes, and you can use it for uh, for streamlined flow also. So that depends on the user, and for the micro pump, you'll be using. The, the last question from my side, sir, uh, can we extend it to some kind of a biosorbable material? Biosorbable? Uh, basically, you mean to say that biodegradable thing, right, sir? Yes, and uh, without any, uh, and getting cleared from the body. Yeah, so the uh, thing is that uh, with the material I use, like this carbon, uh, it, it does not uh, show any degradation yet. So definitely this material cannot be degraded but of course, the drug you can uh, use it to modify the surface of this material, this microneedle, carbon microneedle. Uh, when you will insert that one to the body, then that drug can be dissolved in the body. But this material itself does not degrade yet. All right, so thank you, sir. Uh, there are a lot of other wonderful questions, uh, but at your time reasons, uh, we, I would like to close here. But having said that, uh, we will definitely mail uh, Dr. Vidhan all the questions. And yeah. And he will uh, respond to them. Yeah, I'll uh, be very happy to, to respond to all the questions people are having so that I can get uh, some of the good students as well as some of the good collaborators to work further. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank all of you. Fantastic, sir. Thank you. Um, now um, we're going to uh, take the next speaker uh, for this session. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Uh, Jain Kandare, um, uh, and uh, before he delivers his talk, um, I would like to uh, if you read out his profile, in fact his CV runs to several pages, so what I have in front of me is a very brief uh, introduction, so those of you who want to... Yeah. Uh, Suresh, Suresh sir, this is uh, yeah. Dr. Krishnan is already in uh, okay, uh, Dr. Krishnan can take over. Uh, if you can introduce, uh, you he can know. introduce. Okay, Dr. Suresh okay. can introduce, not a problem. I'll just participate. No issue, no issue. Please, Dr. Suresh, go ahead. You started, you go ahead. All right, sir. Uh, Dr. Jain Kandare received his PhD in chemical engineering from National Chemical Laboratory, Pune, India. His research interests are at the interface of macromolecular chemistry, targeted drug delivery. 3D cancer cell scaffolds and 3D surfaces. He was a senior research scientist heading Polymer Chemistry Group in drug discovery company Piramal Healthcare Limited, India, and has published 45 research papers. Uh, his recent research on multi component nanosystems for capturing circulating tumor cells has been published in Advanced Healthcare Materials 2013 as a cover page inside Nature India Research Highlights. Dr. Kandai has filed 11 US uh, PCD patent applications. He has published two books on popularization of science. His research-based startup, Actorius Innovations and Research, is involved in designing multiple components for cancer diagnostics. He is also the founder of Right to Research Foundation, a nonprofit researcher's entity in Pune. Now, I'd uh, like to hand over the uh, the session to Dr. Jain Kandari. Uh, good evening, everybody. My apologies that uh, there was some uh, glitch in my computer uh, entering into a right time. But thank you, Professor Suresh, uh, Dr. Krishnan, all faculty of Vellore VIT Institute. Uh, I had an opportunity to be there uh, several years back, maybe a decade back, and I um, I'm really inspired and very, very highly motivated about 
the institute, Velour Institute uh, in total. So thank you for invite and I hope uh, that I will finish my talk in 22 to 24 minutes. I'm not going to dwell great into the cancer biology, but I'm going to actually speak about the bio-inspired antibody-based uh, technology that we have developed in the name of uh, Onco Discover and uh, how does it has actually moved from lab to clinic. I'm going to actually uh, cover up the content as a background about uh, cancer. All of us are now uh, dealing with a pandemic uh, in a very severe case, uh, but I would like to actually go back and talk about uh, some of the diseases, including cancer, which are actually, uh, uh, the incidences are rising. I would also cover uh, the diagnosis of cancers, uh, primarily liquid biopsy, metastasis, how does the extravagation uh, takes place? What is the background of, of a spread of a cancer from primary tumor to the secondary tumors? I would also uh, share about India's first cancer detection technology in isolating and uh, detecting tumor cells or circulating tumor cells. And the trade name with an Onco Discover Drug Controller General of India has recently approved it. And we are very glad that this technology is now available in India with a very affordable cost. Uh, I would also like to cover up a case study, two or three slides about the clinical uh, studies that we conducted with Tata Memorial Hospital as a clinical performance, which led into the approval from CDSCO and the DCJ. Uh, if Professor Suresh permits, and if time permits, we can take a few questions and answers. Uh, as mentioned, um, I'm a PhD in chemical engineering and earlier with a master of pharmacy. And that's the time when actually, after uh, coming back to India, uh, we were a very strong collaborators with the uh, Veller Institute of Technology with Professor Suresh. And we, we are very glad that we, we are a co-author of uh, uh, one good paper that was published uh, in the back. The point I'm trying to uh, narrate through my bio sketch is typically in translation of a technology one has to have an interdisciplinary uh, background, probably uh, knowledge and information and ex experience over uh, 20 years in order to actually translate such kind of a technology, which is a uh, very uh, good few examples in India, and maybe a second example uh, in a whole world of actually a technology called as circulating tumor cells. To best of our information, we are the second company in the world who has got uh, this technology in the market. Uh, me and my co-founder, Dr. Arvindan Vasudevan, founded this company in 2013 in Pune after working in Piramal for uh, more than four and a half years and past experiences uh, as postdocs and as an humble fellow. Uh, we know that uh, uh, overall India imports medical devices in billions of uh, dollars worth and the government is seeking to actually reduce these numbers very, very highly. We have filed several patents and we work into uh, commercial innovations, uh, uh, technologies of very, very challenging domains, which might take uh, uh, six years to 10 years of a time, may require uh, millions of dollars and probably would be an incremental uh, innovations in the field. We have been recently approved uh, uh, ISO 13485 medical devices quality management approval by British Standard uh, Institute. Um, as I mentioned that uh, all these uh, concepts to translations require immense clinical performances over years and then getting into the clinical trials and clinical performance and finally getting DCG approval is a gold standard for any, any researcher. I'm very glad that we were recently uh, being credited as an innovator uh, by global bioscience in 2020. I'm very glad that uh, I acknowledge here, we, uh, we see here on the board Onco Discover team, uh, which consists of about uh, 10 to 12 scientists from various backgrounds, from various countries, and uh, uh, very high reverence to my uh, two collaborators from Tata Memorial Hospital, Paryal, Mumbai, Dr. Pankaj Chaturvedi, who is a deputy director and surgical oncologist, head and neck cancer in Tata Memorial Hospital and Dr. Kobar Prabash, who are known to be expertise in uh, clinical validations in cancer domain. 
uh, I must acknowledge that the funding that was uh, given to us by multiple uh, agencies, including DPT BIRAC and uh, uh, supported by Venture, NCL Venture Center in Pune. Uh, we have filed a patent long back as a multifunctional magnetopolymeric nanosystem for rapid targeting, isolation, and detection of uh, circulating tumor cells. And um, we were also noted as India science startups by one of an international uh, uh, magazine. We are recently featured by multiple uh, uh, media houses, including Times of India uh, and other networks uh, that, that are known in this country. We're very glad and pleased and privileged that our technology was open for uh, societal benefit, which was an unmet need in India by our Dr. Harshwardhan, who, was an, who is an honorable health minister of India and launched onco Discovery liquid biopsy technology in Pune very recently. And we are covered as a simple test, rapid test in detecting circulating tumor cell in small pull up a blood sample as a non-invasive uh, detection test. Uh, due to the time, I would not be able to actually cover up uh, all the aspects, but uh, enthusiastic students and faculty might uh, want to visit this uh, site, uh, www.oncodiscover.com, where you would find actually benefits of liquid biopsy and uh, the test uh, uh, details uh, more. Um, it's not a surprise that cancer is multifaceted global health uh, uh, issue that actually continues to demand many, many actions. However, uh, in detecting uh, our diagnosis and the therapy problems persist and they exist because of uh, three primary components that the, typically the delayed diagnosis, the sensitivity of the diagnosis is very, very poor and finally in, ineffective treatment. Um, what you see as a global incidences on the board uh, the global cancer data 2018 discloses that global cancer incidences were very high in Americas, about 21%, in Europe, 23.4%, where total number of incidents worldwide were more than 18 million uh, people. And the global mortality was is 2.96 million in 2018. Uh, in spite of the high incidences in US, the mortality incidences are uh, lesser, lower, um, also in Europe. However, the global uh, data predicts that there will be more than 30 million cancer deaths in another 10 to 12 years of a time. Let us see what, what is an Indian statistics. There were 1.2 million new cases per year in 2019, 0.8 million deaths uh, uh, occurred in that year and about 67% of mortality rate. Remember the, the five year survival rates in India are very, very low about 60% in North America and Europe, and in India, about 30%. And predominantly, India caters high, high incidences in head and neck cancer. That is what is our primary domain of multiple clinical studies that we did at Tata Memorial Hospital. Breast cancer stands as a number two incidences, then survival cancer and lung cancers. Uh, let me state here a point that the incidences of cancer are predominantly, uh, 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 are propelled by three uh, important aspects the uh, increased geriatric population worldwide. The second cause of increased incidences of cancer is because of a sedentary lifestyle. And the third important is the greed to market and manufacture everything uh, without not knowing or not studying the uh, implications of this uh, chemical components that are, uh, that are actually implicated on the human health. So my chapter number one, liquid biopsy, the point number one that the mortality uh, from the cancer, which are from the primary origin is very, very small. That's about 10%. Whereas most of the cancer deaths occur from the metastasis, uh, metastatic cancer. In order to actually understand liquid biopsy, there is, uh, there is a very uh, old term about 160 years old called as a seed and soil hypothesis. How does the primary cancer progress into the uh, uh, metastasis? It was defined by Stephen Paget, who was a professor in UK, uh, who proposed and coined this theory called as a seed and soil hypothesis. Uh, on the left-hand side, typically an oncologist uh, have a an, uh, habit uh, of reading this radiologic, uh, radiological PET scan, which actually indicates the, the cancer uh, metastasis cancer in a large and a whole body. On the right-hand side, 
there is a theory that has been proposed and actually established in few studies that the cancer cells which uh, migrate from the primary tumor, once these primary cancer cells actually fall at the primary site, they, they reach to the peripheral blood capillaries, which are in a smaller size over to the size of cancer cell alone. But because of their plasticity, they enrich, they enter into these capillaries and they disseminate and they, they come out. So that is what is an extra vagation theory uh, proposed, being proposed by many academicians uh, in uh, several models. So the primary cancers, as I mentioned, um, are defined by actually a biopsies, which is uh, conformity of a solid tissue biopsy for the treatment. However, let us understand that solid tissue biopsy is highly invasive. It, it needs some small uh, operatives, which is painful. It needs uh, multiple complex uh, 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 operational theaters and multiple doctors involvement. And the focus is primary on the primary tumors and the cancer staging and intratumoral or spatial heterogeneity is very, very vast. So it does not establish a very specific uh, component of a uh, primary reason of a cancer. The treatment and prognostic decisions are taken with solid tissue biopsies. However, the progression of a disease or the overall survival cannot be monitored by actually a solid tissue biopsies. On the other hand, liquid biopsies are non-invasive. You could actually pull up a small amount of uh, uh, blood uh, volume, which is uh, slightly uh, non-invasive. It can actually profile both primary as well as secondary tumors and molecular insights of metastasis can be uh, shown, demonstrated at the genetic level. Uh, one could actually see the longitudinal disease surveillance uh, through the liquid biopsy, either by genetic uh, profiling. Uh, one can actually look for the treatment uh, responses from the chemotherapy post uh, operatives or post uh, radiation. And one could actually monitor the tumor burden uh, through the liquid biopsy. I'm going to detail about the, the liquid biopsy that what uh, we developed. So circulating tumor cells, which is a very old term, which actually are the, the, are the cells which are in circulation, which are disseminated from the primary site of a tumor, and uh, they circulate for extensive period of a time and reach to the secondary uh, sites, uh, secondary substrates. And liquid biopsy also consists of uh, other parameters indicative for the treatment or analyzing the uh, genomics of the uh, cancer types for the treatment or the responses or the resistances, including circulating cell-free DNA or CCF DNA or circulating cell-free RNA, CCF RNA. And uh, there are also other components which are called as extravascular uh, components, including exosomes. But my talk will actually consist of circulating tumor cell cancers. As I mentioned that there's a primary endothelial uh, uh, cancer prototype, which actually um, harbors the cancer cells, which are disseminated, they shade off, they fall from the primary healthy tissue or primary necrotic tissue. They come in the peripheral circulation and they reach to the other part. It is shown widely that when you take cell lines and uh, uh, inject into the genografts, the tumors are uh, comparatively smaller over to the circulating tumor cells if they were actually they were implanted into the uh, mouse models. So therefore, the presence of one or more circulating tumor cell predicts early recurrence and decreased overall survival in chemo patients in uh, typically breast cancers. But why detection of circulating tumor cell uh, technology is very challenging and why it is expensive? Because one ml of a blood of epithelial cancer patient will consist of one billion of red blood cells it will have more than seven to eight million uh, white blood cells and very rare circulating tumor cancer cells. So therefore, detection of circulating tumor uh, uh, cells in blood is like trying to find the proverbial uh, needle in haystack. So before we started our company, we, we uh, studied that FDA had approved a uh, CTC technology for early uh, metastasis cancer detection uh, in a name of a cell search in 2004 in US. The cost, co the cost was prohibitively expensive. And when we started this, this cost was more than $2,000. Currently it's, it's about uh, $1,000. Uh, only two graphs in my presentation today. If there were more than three circulating tumor cells or five tumor cells in prostate and breast cancer respectively, uh, if there were five or more in 7.5 ml of a blood, 
at any given time of a point of uh, in 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 peripheral blood of a cancer patient it is predictive of shorter progression free survival and overall survival if you look at the y axis and the x axis the patient had three or five circulating tumor cells and the overall survival prediction would be about 15 months uh, from this graph um, as i mentioned that circulating tumor cells uh, if they are identified if they are isolated in 7.5 ml one could actually predict the response uh, from the treatment in this case the patient particularly had 30 circulating tumor cell they, they kept on increasing in spite of one chemotherapy and uh, when when the oncologist or the board changed the uh, therapy the circulating tumor cells dropped down indicating the disease burden is actually lower we have uh, compared and valued validated our technology in breast cancer and bladder cancer colorectal cancer lung cancer and very predominantly with healthy volunteers blood sample as uh, eliminating the false positive cases so the circulating tumor cell detection and cancer types are are indicated on this board uh, hello hello Hello. Hello. Sir, it seems there is uh, some communication error or technical error from the speakers and Ah, uh, do we wait now, sir? Ah, uh, yeah, it's very Yeah, can, can we wait for a couple of minutes for him to uh, hook back uh, you know, Yes, restart, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, 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 we have five minutes more. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, Uh, Dr. Krishnan, can you hear me? Dr. Krishnan, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. I can hear you, uh, Professor. Um, as of now, there's only one. Uh, let's say, no, there there are no. As of now, there are no questions posed. Um, right. Uh, would you like to ask a couple of questions? to the speaker or yeah to the speaker not not now when he when he finishes his talk once okay hello uh can you hook back can you log in again i we are waiting we are waiting we are waiting i could you do it in a minute or two is it possible yeah please try please try thank you thank you thank you uh dr jitan dr jitan yes sir yes sir yeah uh, dr uh, jayant is uh, trying to uh, log in again yeah 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 uh, and he should be back in a minute or so yeah yeah, yeah. i'm i'm waiting we are waiting okay. uh dr krishnan if there is a time constraints then after the talk we will stop is, is that what it is yeah that is what because i don't know after this meeting 
it is one more session i do not know yeah 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 there is one more session yeah so okay sir so after the talk uh, the uh, podium is all yours sir dr okay in terms of thanking the speaker and right right thank you sir thank you sir yeah Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yeah, hello. Yeah, I'm available. Ah, uh ha. -huh. Okay. Um. Uh, so you're gonna try it? Yes. 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 Right. Thank you. Ah, uh, Doctor Jitend. Yes, sir. Ah, uh, he's gonna try one more time. If it works, okay. it works. Otherwise, he's gonna call us back. Okay, okay. So maybe in another two minutes uh, we'll try or we'll wrap up the session. Yeah. And the yeah, question yes. and answer will be uh, done through emails. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thanks. Professor Krishnan, I think uh, we should uh, proceed for the wrapping up the session. Either we'll be uh, getting late for the next session. Uh, uh, Doctor so, Krishnan, can you just wind up, sir? Can you right, right. We'll do that. So, uh, please inform uh, Doctor Jayant about this. All right, sir. Right. Thank you. Thanks for thanks to both speakers, Doctor Bidan uh, Pramanik and Doctor Jayant Kandare. Uh, thanks for excellent talk and of course it's very interesting but however due to technical glitch the second talk would not be continued and all the questions will be posted to dr Ka, you know, jayan kandare and then you'll get the feedback on the same uh, i take this opportunity to uh, thank all the participants and the panel members uh, you know uh, you know having uh, you know participated in this conference and made it as an effective session Thank you all. Thank you. We'll wrap up this uh, session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Professor Jitain and the co-hosts, Dr. Priyanka Sivaswa. Thank you. Professor Jitain, thank you. Yeah, thanks, thanks, sir. Yeah. We'll be joining at 5.45 in the next session, which is the last session for the two days, uh, first day of the conference. Uh, see you soon after 15 minutes. Thank you to all audience. Thank you.